Happy birthday! I'm sorry, what was that? You don't know whose birthday it is? Well, mine, of course. At least it's supposed to be. Whoops. What YouTuber makes a birthday video that isn't about themselves? Pfft, please. But it's not just my birthday, because four years ago today, one of my favorite Pokemon games came out. That's right, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. Four years? Damn, I feel old. That's right, I like Black 2 and White 2, and you probably hate me for that, but I don't care, it's our birthday. And what better to do for someone's birthday than to judge every fiber of their being? Now, before I begin, I should explain my method of reviewing. Each game I review will be critiqued upon five different attributes that make up the game. Region and roster, art design and graphics, music, features, and story. Each category can earn a total of five points with an overall possible score as high as 25 points and as low as zero points. This score will be determined at the end of the video. Remember, these scores are based upon my opinion and should not be taken seriously as my opinion really doesn't matter. I like each and every Pokemon game for one reason or another, even if my review doesn't seem to express that. Now that that's out of the way, let's begin. I'm Joe Mahogany, and today I'm going to be reviewing Pokemon Black 2 and Pokemon White 2. Spoilers abound. Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 are the Pokemon games that succeeded Pokemon Black and White, being the first games to break the tradition of a third game that added only a few new things to the preceding games. And you have to consider how huge of an idea that was, especially because everyone and their mother's mother was expecting us to get a grey version. Not only that, but this was the first time a pair of Pokemon games got direct sequels, not like Gold and Silver, which were indirect sequels to Red and Blue. Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 are set two years after the events of the originals. In those two years, new towns and locations have been established in the Union of a region, with an almost doubled roster of Pokemon. Like in Black and White, Team Plaza is running rampant, but now it's up to a new trainer to take them down. Like I said earlier, I really like Pokemon Black 2 and White 2, for a lot of reasons. But it's been four years since they came out, and since then we've gotten X and Y, and, well, we know what Sun and Moon's gonna look like. And... damn. So how do they hold up? Are they really as terrible as everyone says they are? Or are they unappreciated masterpieces? Let's find out. With Pokemon Black 2 and White 2, Unova got a huge upgrade in terms of how the region looks and works. The landscapes have become more diverse, with sand-stricken mountainscapes and underwater tunnels, not to mention some version-exclusive locations like the Route 4 Ruins in White 2. Let's also not forget some of the overhauls they did for older locations like the Nambasa City Gym and Victoria Road. With the addition of these new locations, Unova has become less linear, no longer just being a big circle, but having branching paths. Although some things are still only available during certain seasons, which to completionists may be kind of tedious, having to wait for seasons to pass before you can get to that one item. However, that just leaves more to discover, and like in Black and White, the region doesn't require you use HMs to move on. However, there are still obstacles that hinder your progress, like stupid Heartbreaker Charles. GO AWAY CHARLES! NOBODY CARES ABOUT YOUR ROMANTIC STRUGGLES! <clears throat> and with an updated region, we also get an updated Pokedex. Pokemon Black and White brought us one of the biggest regional rosters since Gen 1, with 156 new Pokemon. And Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 gave us one of the biggest in-game rosters at the time, with 300 Pokemon in the regional Pokedex. Think about it, that's double the size of Kanto. Well, roughly. Then again, X and Y had to go and ruin everything, but that's a video for another time. While every Unova Pokemon remains in the Pokedex, 144 out-of-region Pokemon were added into the game, ranging from every region across the map. Heck, one of the first non-Unova Pokemon you encounter is from Johto. Like, who expects that? It's just some Kanto scrub like Caterpie or something. This newly expanded roster gives players a greater range of choice when it comes to picking their team. Will they use all Unova Pokemon? Maybe a mix of Unova and other regions? Or perhaps just an all non-Unova party? Really, the possibilities are endless. And a cool thing the game does to get you into the feel of having more than just Unova Pokemon is by slowly introducing them throughout the game. Until you get to Castelia, of course, because then... ALL of the Kanto. Unova was a very diverse region to begin with, with so many unique and creative designs, however, its landscapes were lacking. So the fact that they were able to improve both the roster and region beyond expectation means it deserves to be appreciated for the astounding effort. 
Yet while the roster of Pokemon was excellent, solving the problems with the lack of water types and giving us some old favorites to mess around with on our new adventure, Unova itself remains almost unchanged and can't exactly be called one of the most unique regions. However, the many secrets it holds still leave me discovering new things about the place to this very day. I'm just gonna say it, Unova's beautiful. Unlike other regions, Unova's environments are more urban than the rest. With seemingly constant construction in the plethora of big cities, and the game's art style reflects that while still keeping the Pokemon feel. When you're in a city, you feel like it's filled with people bustling about living their lives, especially in Castelia. But when you get out into nature, it feels as though it's still attached to man-made environments, such as a road running through a forest or structures like the Marine too. There seems to be a lack of balance between man and nature that the other regions possess. It gives the region a bit of separation from the others, which seems intended considering how Black and White was kind of like Pokemon's attempt at a reboot. Like the games that came before it, Black 2 and White 2 have a very sprite-heavy basis when it came to the game's design, with all the characters being sprite art. However, the trend to partially 3D environments that began in Gen 4 are present in the Gen 5 games, and much more heavily as well. While the 3D allows for more interesting environments to be created, it does sometimes heavily contrast with the overworld sprites. Not only that, but the changing camera angles that are present throughout the game can obscure the sprites, especially the moving ones in the battle scenes. The concept of moving sprites was present in the older games, however, Gen 5 completely redefined them. In Gen 5, we got full moving sprites that ran through the entire battle rather than just being present upon a Pokémon being sent out. Gen 5 also gave us moving trainer sprites that acted like the older Pokémon moving sprites, which performed a short animation before becoming static. However, in Black and White, this was only present in special NPCs, but with Black 2 and White 2, every trainer got a unique animation, akin to what we're getting in Pokémon Sun and Moon. Perhaps those games will take more cues from Gen 5. With the fancy 3D Pokemon games we have today, it can sometimes be hard to return to the old graphics of days past, but Black 2 and White 2 were able to pull off being so inviting in design, it's not hard to come back at all. Soothing, astonishing, heart-pounding, the call of awaiting adventure. These are the words I would use to describe the excellent music in Pokemon Black 2 and White 2, old and new tracks alike. You might hear me say it a few times, but I think Gen 5 has the best combination of what makes previous gens great, and one of those aspects is its use of music. Like in Gen 4, Gen 5 uses multiple music tracks for one area or scene. Themes will change between seasons or the time of day, and we even get alternate battle themes depending on what's happening. Gym Leader's last Pokemon? Here's a tune to get you pumped up for victory. About to faint? Here's an intense, ear-pulsing tune to make your heart race. Or how about a rare Pokemon? Let's just give you a whole new battle theme. Winter is backed by the faint chime of bells, the spring is alight with flutes, horns pulse in the summer blaze, and autumn's... well, there. And the gyms each have their own overworld theme. <coughs> At least he's the best. <coughs> and with the sequels, old amazing themes get some new mixes. Most notably Getsis, the maniacal boss of Team Plasma. In black and white, his theme was intense and regal, a battle you'd fought through your whole adventure to achieve. You conquered the Pokemon League and defeated the King of Team Plasma. Yet this man still looks down on you as his theme slowly delves into madness, exemplifying who Getsis is, mucking crazy. But in Black 2 and White 2, there is no build-up to madness. Being thwarted by a child once more, Getsis relinquishes his sanity, and his theme lets you know that as its distorted and intense choir begins to chant. And that's just one theme that got changes. The legendary tune that backs the battle between you and Reshiram or Zekrom has become distorted and darker under the chilling presence of Black or White Kiram, leaving you to feel helpless and cold. But while some themes delved into the darkness, some rise into light. In Black and White, End's battle theme was intense. This was supposed to be the final battle between truth and ideals, the final showdown with your ultimate enemy, but in the sequels, it isn't your enemy, and your battle is not one for the history books. And his change, his point of view no longer skewed by Getsis, and that is reflected in his battle theme. There's something light about it, and is no longer constrained, he's free. Well, let's not forget how the perfect balance of synths and instruments are what make the many excellent pieces of Unova sound so good. From the heart-pounding battle themes to the eye-opening routes and calming cities, if there was ever a region whose music inspired adventure the most, it would be Unova's. If Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 were known for anything, it would be its extensive post-game and the rampant enhanced features of the game. Okay, so Black 2 and White 2 has kind of a bad habit of forcing you to sit through the tutorials for features you don't really care about. And I don't care how mucking amazing the PWT is, I don't want to sit through it to progress through the game. They actually make you sit through making a stupid Pokestar Studios movie. At least you don't have to sit and watch that crap. I'm just gonna say it, Pokestar Studios is stupid. 
It is the Pokemon epitome of Hollywood and why it is terrible. Making crap for the sake of making crap. And seriously, when I entered the filming studio, I actually said, and I quote, No wonder your movies suck so much, it's all filmed on a green screen. This actually disgusts me. It is actually worse than the Pokemon musicals, which are still a thing, by the way. I know, I didn't know they still existed either. Along with Pokestar Studios, they also force Join Avenue on you. Luckily, the introduction stops before the actual tutorial, and the game actually gives you a choice of whether to continue or not. However, aside from those... Features. There are many other things added to the game to keep you busy, like the Pokemon World Tournament or the Menagerie of Legendary Pokemon. The PWT is kind of like Gen 5's Battle Frontier, but instead of fighting new trainers, you face off against old ones like gym leaders, champions, and Elite Four members. There's also the cool Memory Link feature, which allows you to see events that occurred over the past two years, and even activate in-game adventures as being able to fight and capture N's Pokemon, which are identifiable by a green and glow, or battles with characters using their team from the previous game, like that with Bianca in New Vemitown. And for all your completions, we also receive an extension of the Pokedex that shows us our progress on our capturing a Pokemon in a specific area, similar to the recent Dex Nav in Aurax. There's also medals. Woohoo. But I personally just like to sit back and look at the news bulletin. For no reason in particular, it's just that such a small feature brings a bit of life to the game. Oh yeah, and the battle subway is a thing. I don't know. Overall, you know has got so many things going on that's still keeping me busy to this very day. Like every Pokemon game before, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 follows the basic concept of collecting 8 gym badges and saving the region from the escapades of an evil team. And like Black and White, this evil team is Team Plasma. However, the team's goals and the overall tone of the game has changed. But let's start from the beginning. Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 take place two years after Black and White, starring a brand new trainer. Our journey begins in Aspersia City, the very first starting location that is a city. There we receive our pick of Snivy, Oshawott, or Tepic from a familiar face, Bianca, who also gives us our Pokedex, which is actually given to us for a reason that makes sense, to discover the new species that have cropped up in Unova, which makes a whole lot more sense than go find all of the Pokemon, even though we shouldn't know what all of them are because they're native to this place. Because we all know that's just stupid. What else is stupid is that Bianca just so happens to know the Pokedex for you. Even though she's only in a Spurge City to give one person a Pokemon and Pokedex. I find this huge plot hole even more insulting considering how it has zero plot relevance. He was only given a Pokedex to have a Pokedex. He doesn't even plan on using it for its intended purpose. And I digress. Anyhow, he was our rival, and I didn't know this until I replayed the game for this review, but you can name him, which differs from Black and White. Hugh's whole story is that Team Plasma stole his sister's purloin five years prior, and now he has a vendetta against them. And I find it funny how Hugh's little sister literally does not seem to care about this purloin. She probably doesn't remember. Meanwhile, Hugh is over here being PETA incarnate, ganging up on poor farmers who just let their Pokemon run around for a bit. Like, dude, calm down. Seriously though, if this dude would just look up from his own airheadedness, he would see he is literally standing right next to that herdier. <sighs> Anyhow, Hugh's whole issue as a character throughout the game is that he believes the strength of his Pokemon comes from him, and he has to be overly protective of them. However, eventually he learns that the strength of his Pokemon is not on him alone, but relies on both him and his team. Early on, we encounter Team Plasma, before the first gym even which is the earliest we've ever met an evil team, and it seems they have a rather great presence already. But it's probably because of the revelation that Team Plasma is back. In this earlier part of the game, we are in a completely new part of Unova, consisting of Aspersia City, Foxy Town, a few routes, and Burbank City, where this stupid arc with Roxy and her father takes place. Like, dude, I don't want to sit through your movie, just take me to Castelia. And from there, Unova's relatively the same. I say relatively because it's been two years. As we're constantly reminded. So there are new locations like the Castelia Sewers, where we find Team Plasma once again doing... something. After Team Plasma's defeat in Castelia, we're introduced to Colrus, whom we learn is a high-ranking member of the new Neo Team Plasma. But unlike Team Plasma, Colrus does not seek to use Pokemon as tools to be used for conquest, or thinks that they need to be separated from humans. As a matter of fact, his ideals directly oppose Team Plasma. Colrus understands that Pokemon and humans need one another in order for both to unlock their true strengths. And really, Colrus is only with Team Plasma for their resources. As we progress, we will learn that Team Plasma has divided in two, Neo Team Plasma and the Reform Team Plasma, 
We need to take care of and return any Pokemon the old Plasma took from their trainers. The reformed Team Plasma is in Driftville City, and while there, he realizes that maybe they have Purloin. However, upon being asked about it, the reformed Sage Rude expresses that Purloin isn't there. Now, you might be wondering why I'm pointing this out. Well, that's because Purloin is one of the most common Pokemon in the Unova region, and you're sitting over here rude, if that's even your real name, telling me that you don't have a single Purloin? Get out. Now that I've had a few hours to calm down, let's continue. As the third of Team Plasma grows, with the knowledge of their massive frigate, the Swords of Justice appear from hiding, sensing the danger. They appear to the player in order to compel them to continue on their crusade against Plasma, and upon reaching Mistralton City, Professor Juniper sends you off to learn more about Team Plasma's plan by seeking counsel with the mayor and gym leader of Opelousa City, Drayden. You then learn that Team Plasma plans to use the power of the legendary Pokémon Kyurem to freeze over Unova and take control. In fact, the Sage Zinzalan and Neo Team Plasma manage to freeze Opelousa City, driving the player eastward. After defeating the 8th Gym Leader, it is finally time for the player to face Team Plasma in a final battle. On the Team Plasma Frigate, you encounter Getsus, who reveals his plans of conquest before stalling you at the Shadow Trial and why he flees to the Giant Chasm. It is here that Hugh is reunited with Purloin, now Lifeheart, but we don't care. In the Giant Chasm, Getsus is ready to enact his plans. However, when N arrives, not only does it prove an issue, but it inevitably helps the Mastermind. When N attempts to use his legendary dragon Pokemon, Zekrom and Black 2 and Reshiram and White 2, Getsus uses the DNA Splicer to give Kyurem the ability to fuse with the legendary. Good job, N. In this turn of events, it is up to you to stop Black or White Kyurem before it can use its power. Upon the enraged beast defeat, it flees, leaving Getsus enraged. Not accepting defeat, to a child again he attacks the player in a final attempt to win, but his effort is fruitless. He will not accept defeat and is taken away by the Shadow Trend so that Team Plasma can never form again. Now, while Black 2 and White 2's story is not as well written as its predecessors, its story still has just as much meaning. A meaning perfectly expressed in one quote. There's always room for folks to grow and change, ain't there? And if you only go after what you think is right, you might end up projecting all thoughts and opinions other than your own. Mighty dangerous. This is said by Clay, the seemingly vindictive and vain gym leader of Driftville City. And it's these words that pertain perfectly to the themes of Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. These games are all about keeping an open mind and listening to what others have to say, or else you may just destroy yourself. This is something Hugh was and Getsus wasn't able to learn. Hugh realized that if he kept on the overprotective and guilt strict path he was on, he and his Pokemon could never truly become strong and gets us believed too strongly in his perspective of the world, and that was what destroyed him. Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 are some of my favorite Pokemon games. They capture what makes Pokemon great and sticks to that. They're beautiful and well-defined games that don't take themselves too seriously while still retaining a fun and intriguing story. So now, here are my judgments for Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. For region and roster, I give these games a 5 out of 5. Not only was Unova a great region to begin with, but the fact that Game Freak was able to improve it further speaks wonders. For art design and graphics, a 3.5 out of 5. While I love the art style of Black 2 and White 2, they really pale in comparison to games like Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Meanwhile, the 3D elements of the games often contrast with the 2D, which is why I give it this score. The music earned a 5 out of 5. For me, Gen 5 as a whole contains some of the best Pokemon music we've ever gotten. And while there are a few I'm not a fan of, the ratio is too vast for it to affect the score. The features of Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 gain a 3 out of 5. While the PW2 is an amazing piece of Pokemon post-game history, it does have a lot of features we could do without. Stupid Pokestar Studios. Lastly, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 story earns it a 4 out of 5. I love the story, but from a writer's perspective, it is nothing compared to Black and White. However, it holds just as much meaning. So, in conclusion, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 earns a total score of 20.5 out of 25. These are very solid games, and if anyone were to ask me, I would definitely say they are worth playing. If you've played the first ones, of course. So that's Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 for you. Man, what amazing games. They're definitely up there in my favorite Pokemon games. And personally, I think they're better than Black and White. Oh, excuse me.
Hmm. A package for me? That's odd. I don't have any friends. Who'd send me something? Hmm. 